Welcome everyone to COVID-19 at the Community Library Forum, brought to you in partnership with the Ajax Public Library and Pickering Public Library. We are pleased that everyone could join us and our speakers for this important conversation. My name is Sarah Dodge and I'm the Coordinator of Community Engagement at the Ajax Public Library. Your hosts for this evening, along with myself, are from Pickering, Jessica Trenier, Client Experience Specialist, Adult Programming, Claire Shalaki, Client Experience Specialist, Becky George, Client Experience Specialist, and Alexander Frank, Client Experience Associate. From Ajax, Cindy Poon, Manager of Public Service, and Lynn Yates, Community Engagement Associate. If you are having technical difficulties with this presentation, please place a comment in the chat feature and a staff member will assist you. For phone participants, press star nine to request assistance. This event is being recorded and will be posted on our respective library websites for follow-up viewing. To that end, we will be turning off your webcams, voice and or phone so that you are not displayed in the recording. Our presenters will remain on screen with your hosts joining them at various points. Our format for this evening is as follows. 7 to 7.50 p.m. presentations and 7.50 to 8.30 p.m. Q&A. During this time, your questions will be answered. Questions will be accumulated throughout the presentations by the chat feature or via star 9 for phone participants. If your question is not addressed during the forum, a staff member will follow up with you at a later date. We are pleased to have the following speakers with us this evening. Dr. Tony Stone, Dr. Pepe McTavish, and Alec King. For our first presentation, I welcome Dr. Tony Stone, Chief of Staff, Lake Ridge Health. Dr. Stone has worked in emergency medicine at Lake Ridge Health since 1992 and also has a family medicine practice in Bowmanville. He is active in the community and has taken on numerous healthcare leadership roles, including posts as president of the Durham Medical Society and president of the Medical Staff Association of Lake Ridge Health. Prior to the formation of Lake Ridge Health, he served as the Chief of Staff at Memorial Hospital Bowmanville. Dr. Stone is a graduate of University of Toronto, completing a Bachelor of Science Honours in Human Biology in 1986 and then Medical School in 1990. Dr. Stone received his certification from the College of Family Physicians of Canada in 1992. Dr. Stone will speak about COVID-19 transmission myths and the use of protective equipment. Dr. Stone, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I, um, I'm not sure um, who's con uh, controlling the slide deck. Uh, so Cindy will control the slide deck for you and um, just say next and she will advance it for you. Okay. Um, Cindy, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so folks, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, there's a lot of slides. I'll try and move fairly quickly, but we'll try to hit um, key points and certainly if there, are, if there are questions, we can address them after. Uh, next slide, Cindy. Uh, so, uh, so SARS uh, coronavirus two is is the, is the name of the virus, uh, that and the disease it causes is COVID nineteen. Uh, you know, uh, coronaviruses have been around with us for a long time. In fact, there are four that are what we call endemic, so they're seasonal and they circulate. Uh, and then there, are, um, and those cause some uh, conditions much more like a bad cold. Uh, 
then you have a couple of uh, illnesses, and many might be familiar with SARS from 2003. Uh, SARS, in fact, um, uh, if you got it, had a higher risk of a very serious illness. But there are only about 8,800 infections worldwide. Um, and it's, it has to do with the behavior and the, the way that uh, the infection spread. And, and, um, and COVID-19 is actually uh, quite different. So um, you'll see here that uh, you know, symptoms range from uh, asymptomatic, and the number of asymptomatic is, remains in doubt. Research is ongoing in that, in that field. I just saw an article today that suggested that uh, the number of asymptomatic could be high. It might be, um, initially people were thinking uh, 18 or 20%, I've heard 50%, and then something I saw today said 80%. We, sim we actually don't know yet uh, how many folks are truly, uh, have truly been uh, exposed and have antibodies. So that's, that's really um, to be determined. It's very important information because it gives you an idea of, of to what extent um, this new coronavirus is in our community or in any community. Uh, for those who are, um, uh, Confirmed cases, though, um, so basically uh, they are categorized into um, sort of mild, severe, and critical, and most of the information would say 80% are mild, and mild has a huge range, uh, and then severe are folks who end up with shortness of breath and low oxygen, um, and then critical, of course, is ICU. Uh, and so next slide, please. So, uh, you know, uh, you'll see here a description of symptoms and uh, what, we, what we, continue, we continue to learn over time. Uh, you know, but folks who are symptomatic uh, and, and are sick in one study, a large number had fever. But if you look at the broad spectrum of illness, it's not universal. So that number, you know, that number could be, uh, depending on the, on the population you're studying and how bad they are, um, it could be 30, 60 percent. Uh, but, you, but when people are symptomatic, we watch for things like newer worsening cough and shortness of breath. There's a whole host that you can see there of atypical symptoms uh, that we pay attention to. And you, you may know folks who, in fact, have had some of these. I think in terms of the clinical course of the illness, the thing we watch for is, is typically sometime around, you know, in between day five and ten. So lots of folks in, uh, who are symptomatic early on will have anything from a, a cold, uh, impact, you know, changes in, in um, their sense of smell or taste, uh, cough, fever, body aches, and so on. A flu-like illness, uh, with, with, uh, often with a dry cough, but not, not always so. And then in day five or ten will be where that subset who's going to get into trouble uh, gets much sicker. That's, that's, that's sort of the typical thing that happens. Uh, go on to the next. Now, this is something that's important for the community to understand. Um, you know, there's, uh, you'll see all kinds of questions and research about how this uh, virus is spread. And, um, and the, the important separation uh, for you and for, and for clinicians is the difference between what you heard as airborne and then droplet. Uh, by and large, uh, airborne um, diseases that are, that are airborne are things like measles or TB. Uh, and they, um, they are uh, uh, carried in the air longer distances and they're suspended in the air for much longer periods of time. The droplets, uh, there are various sizes of droplets. Uh, the common features of droplets are that uh, they tend to settle and then the larger the droplet, the, the, the faster they settle. So ongoing debate about uh, how far droplets propel. By and large, if you, you know, look at guidelines uh, and research internationally, including guidelines from the World Health Organization, uh, from Public Health Agency Canada and our own Public Health Ontario. Um, you know, they say that the vast majority of droplets will settle um, uh, within, six, within six feet. And that's, that's part of the, the rationale for the six, the six feet of social distancing. Uh, also very important to understand, um, you know, from, our, from everyone's perspective, is this growing understanding about um, shedding of the virus before people are symptomatic or those who never become symptomatic. Uh, there's, there's good evidence now to show that in people who are going to be symptomatic, they're already shedding a uh, virus for two days. And this is, this is what, uh, part of what makes this virus unique and, and different certainly than uh, the SARS from uh, past, is there's a, an important burden of, of transmission that occurs before people are symptomatic. That means they screen negative. It means we're, you know, in public spaces, we could be sharing the same spaces. 
and they don't know they're sick and we don't know they're sick. Uh, and that, that is in, in particular true in our own uh, uh, family and friend circles. So some early research was showing that, you know, about three, thir uh, oh, sorry, about uh, three quarters of infections were occurring in, um, in, in circles with, with family and close friends, people we trust, uh, people who have uh, no symptoms. Uh, in people who are symptomatic, uh, research would show that, uh, the, you know, then, then you're practicing all of these self-isolation. And people would say that about uh, the spread inside the home was about uh, 10%. So here's the current situation in uh, Ontario and in uh, Durham. Uh, I won't spend much time on this. I think this information is widely available. Uh, what's important maybe for me to mention is in Ontario, uh, the last time I checked was, um, was yesterday. And Ontario is still experiencing about 200 to 250 new cases of, of and this is new confirmed cases. When you look at these numbers, I just want to uh, mention to everybody that these cases are confirmed. And, uh, and I'll just flag for everyone that uh, while testing capacity is growing in Ontario, it's not as widespread as we would all like. We would love to be able to test everybody who has symptoms, but we don't. Uh, so this is a confirmed cases. Uh, for Lake Ridge, uh, what you'll see here is, um, I'll just highlight uh, the fact that um, the, the solid line represents uh, data around what would be considered a um, mild pandemic wave. Uh, and that, you know, if you look at, you've seen, you've seen New York and you've seen Italy where they had a curve that started to follow more of the dotted line. Uh, the, the, the solid line is mild. We were on that. We started to settle quite nicely as Ontario really um, introduced all the social dis distancing and emergency measures. You'll see that we, we are in a bit of a, a second wave and a, an important part of that wave has been triggered by the uh, severe outbreaks in long-term care and retirement. And you'll see that that's also plateauing. But right now, uh, you know, in the hospital, we have roughly 40 confirmed and another 60 who are uh, where we're awaiting their test results. The COVID assessment center, um, uh, just a flag for everyone, should you become symptomatic and concerned, you know, the, your pathways are to your, to your primary care doc, you can call public health. You can also fill out the form uh, uh, and it's available through public health and through the Lake Ridge website to get um, a telephone assessment. And then they will determine um, if uh, you need an in-person assessment. Next slide. Uh, Long-term care is, is all of our concern. It's certainly um, uh, a, you know, a significant uh, burden for this very vulnerable population. Uh, you can see the numbers there. Uh, and we, you know, we uh, have seen uh, some significant outbreaks here in Durham. Uh, I think roughly there have been roughly, uh, Pepe would know the exact numbers, but roughly 12 homes have been in, in outbreak. And this includes long-term uh, care and retirement uh, with a couple who've had some significant issues. Uh, and, and the object, you know, what we've done is we've, we've uh, partnered at multiple levels with, um, with uh, the, the homes themselves, with Lake Ridge Health, with the military, and with um, uh, the LIN and, and the agencies associated with the LIN to help support those, those environments. So flattening the curve. Um, uh, I think we'll, th this shows a cumulative rate, and, um, and uh, I'll just point out that on the far right, that, that data is too early. The test results. Uh, let's go to the next slide because I think it'll it'll tell folks a bit of a story. The green, yeah. So uh, what I would say here is um, uh, on the far right, you know, there's a lot of information that that is that isn't yet available to us. So don't pay attention to the last four or five days, but pay attention to the rest of it, um, which which gives you a, um, a clear idea of the number of new cases per day in Ontario that were confirmed. Uh, and you can see how we, we were peaking somewhere sort of around, you know, April 12th to 18th. Uh, it looks like we're, the numbers are, are coming down in terms of number of new cases per day. That's great news. You know that that's um, something that everyone pays attention to. And, um, and it's critical when we're, when we're thinking about easing the emergency measures that we're seeing cases drop. And, and we know we have been. That's why you've seen... Um, you know, uh, the government getting, getting comfortable in association with all our public health experts and beginning the very early changes. Now, the reopening strategy I'll speak to very briefly. Um, the government has published a document last week that describes the phases of reopening. 
phase one, um, really, we're, we're transitioning from phase one to phase two, because phase one was really the phase, uh, the safety phase with all the lockdown measures. And phase two, which is the reopening, is in three stages. You can see them uh, listed there. We're already starting to live, uh, you know, stage one of this second phase, which is uh, opening select businesses. You know, the, the thing that um, we're all concerned about and the, and the reason it's all being um, staged uh, or staged out like this is every time we start to uh, increase, uh, you know, our regular circulation in the community, it runs the risk of starting to see a rise in cases. And so this, this slow process, um, what we're hoping is that uh, while we all practice all the right safety things, that we won't see any major spike and start to enter into a, a, an important second wave. Um, so, so the government is, and public, with public health, uh, you know, every two to four weeks, as long as things are under control, we'll see, th we'll see um, I'll say business uh, and retail and so on start to open up more and more. Next slide. Uh, I, th I think what I might do is um, uh, some ba some very some basics here. These 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 are requirements for the opening, and it requires additional additionally to what I just said. Um, it's very important that there's sufficient capacity inside our hospitals to take care of those who are ill. So that's a requirement. And then there's a there's a necessity for public health to be able to um, effectively do uh, their key work, which includes um, case finding. For new cases in the community and then effective um, contact tracing and isolation and so on. Peppy could, Peppy's an expert in that so she could certainly comment more on that. Next slide. Uh, and Dr. Stone, just a reminder, two more minutes. Two Thank minutes. Uh, okay, so we will, um, uh, you know what, let's, let's I, I spoke to this already. Uh, folks know that uh, this, that's uh, part of, uh, of stage, stage one of phase two. So some of the things that are most important for our listeners today are really the, imp the, the, the importance of the basics. I can't, over, I can't overemphasize uh, how important the basics are in keeping you safe and keeping your family safe and keeping the community safe and keeping the number of new cases down. Hand hygiene, there's nothing more important. Um, the, it's, it's straightforward, it's 20 seconds, but it, it is important if you're not sure to do a, a quick video about learning how you wash all your fingers, uh, your hand and your thumbs. Uh, the social distancing, the six feet we spoke about. Uh, this, is, uh, this is etiquette around how you cough and sneeze in your elbow. And then self-isolating when you're unwell. There's good information on uh, the Durham Health website to tell you how to do that properly. Masking, you're going to hear lots about masking. The medical masks are really important for uh, the healthcare sector because there's limits on the, number of the numbers of them. Um, and so I just would want to remind you of that. Non-medical masks like homemade, we think they're actually very important. And while they haven't been proven yet to prevent you from getting infected, they do help um, prevent you from, from um, uh, sending droplets out. Because you know we produce droplets simply by talking and by exhaling when we breathe. Uh, of course, they talk about gloves. Uh, the, 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 uh, it really is a problem with gloves. Droplets can stick on gloves longer. Excellent hand hygiene is actually better than gloves uh, in, in that environment. Uh, this is just information about how, when you're doing your own masking, how you do it properly and safely and how you wash. Uh, those, the information will be available from the slide that the Agency of Canada. I won't go through that detail now. I think I'm out of time momentarily. Next slide. Oh, this is, and if you are symptomatic, uh, before we do conclusion, I just want uh, one more uh, 30 seconds here. Yep. If, you're, if you are symptomatic, please, um, uh, contact your, your primary care uh, physician uh, or uh, public health, and um, you can also uh, contact the assessment center and get an assessment, uh, and also self-isolate uh, while you're symptomatic. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Tony Stone, for that presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stone, for your remarks. Just a reminder that questions continue to be accumulated throughout the presentations via the chat feature or via star nine for phone participants. For our second presentation, I welcome Dr. Pepe McTavish. Dr. McTavish is the Assistant Medical Officer of Health with Durham Region Health Department. Dr. McTavish's focus at the Health Department includes 
infectious diseases prevention and control, immunization, and sexual health. Today, Dr. McTavish will speak about reliable sources of COVID-19 information. Dr. McTavish. Okay, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A session after. If there's any social media sites or great sites that you think I'm missing, I would actually be very um, happy to hear about those. I'm getting better with Twitter uh, and learning um, all the different sites out there. So any recommendations you have for me, I would be appreciated. So the first slide here just shows us we are bombarded with information. There's so many places we can receive information from. Um, I've, oh, distort my video. Oh, hold on. There I am. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I talk with my hands. You're missing it. Um, so this slide just shows us that there are so many ways we can receive information. Certain people like to read their news. Certain people like to watch the news. My husband loves to watch the news. That is not how I like to get my news. Um, so depending on how you would like to receive your news, there's many different channels and many different sources, some more reliable than others. Next slide, Cindy. So this is a slide that I feel like most days right now. So the World Health Leader has actually, the World Health Organization Leader has said we have an infodemic, which means we just, there's too much information. It's bombarding us from all angles, at all sides at all times. And it's really hard. And people find sometimes when they're bombarded by too much information, they just shut out all information. So it can be very hard to figure out um, the best ways or a streamlined way to get information. So World Health, here we go. So this is your first, so we'll sort of go global and then go down to more locally. So the World Health Organization is a trusted global source. It's an excellent source of information. They have a wonderful Q&A section about coronavirus, um, COVID-19, that a lot of the information that Dr. Stone just talked about. So I do recommend you um, review that section. I follow their, um, their handle on Twitter. Oh, we're jumping ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. Um, their Twitter site is very informative. Obviously, there's more things than just COVID-19 um, at the World Health Organization, but right now that is the focus. So this would be sort of the primary site I would go to, um, their main website, and then their Twitter handle. Next slide, Cindy. So the Public Health Agency of Canada, so Dr. Stone mentioned SARS. So the Public Health Agency of Canada actually was created after SARS. For somebody who's sort of been around during SARS um, and, and after, it's hard for me as a public health physician to imagine a world without the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, but it certainly did not exist before SARS. There was funding and um, realizing, realization for the, the need of an, a complete um, national agency for public health. So in public health, we take our direction from the center. So that means we look to the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Teresa Tam, for advice, for information. Uh, I go to their website at least probably every day for something. Um, I bookmark things, which is helpful. Um, but they have an excellent main webpage. So if you go to their main webpage, canada.ca forward slash public health, right away on the home page, you'll see sort of the coronavirus information, but you can get there quicker um, at just canada.ca forward slash coronavirus, but it really is an excellent site. Even many of the documents I use every day are central sort of Canada documents, so I will go to their website. I follow the agency um, on Twitter, and I follow Dr. Tam on Twitter. Uh, she has a wonderful update, uh, usually every day, Canadian stats. Um, she has a lot of really great sort of positive messages about public health and sort of more feel-good stories, and I really enjoy following her on uh, social media. And then next we have the Ontario government. So like I said, we'll go sort of larger and then in. So the Ontario government is a great website. Um, I find that their Twitter and social media is excellent. This is how I usually find out about the next steps about reopening <laughs> because I'm not usually around my television. I don't like to get my news on television. So I don't see the press conferences by Premier Ford. I don't see Dr. Williams' updates. So I then you know, learn about them on Twitter and on their website, which is still a great way to get it. So the Ontario site is excellent, the Ontario.ca forward slash coronavirus. So Dr. Stone mentioned that self-assessment you can do if you're having symptoms. So that would be where you would find that. The Ontario Ministry of Health site is also excellent, more focused on health than the Ontario government site, although they're both quite focused on coronavirus right now and COVID-19. Um, so that's still another one I follow. And then Public Health Ontario. So many people don't actually know about Public Health Ontario. So Public Health Ontario was formed after SARS as well. Uh, in Public Health Ontario, they are a scientific and advisory body. So they create a lot of the documents for the Ministry of Health. They provide a lot of the scientific evidence. So Dr. Tony Stone was talking about the evidence on the, um, the six feet, the droplet spread. So it would be the scientists and the public health physicians at Public Health Ontario that would create a lot of this information. 
So they have great summary documents, you know, should you wear a mask in public, um, what personal protective equipment you need to wear. So those great documents are all found on the main Public Health Ontario site. And now over to us at the Health Department. So I would like to brag, I have nothing to do with how great the website of the Health Department is, I really don't. But it is a wonderful, wonderful resource. Uh, it's a great resource for all things health and all things public health, but especially, especially right now with novel coronavirus and um, COVID-19. So the main website is there for you. On the main website, uh, it's very long. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's lots of good stuff. But sort of a third of the way down, you'll see our, um, our data tracker. So I put the link there for you, durham.ca forward slash COVID cases. This is an excellent tool. It has been uh, copied in other places because it's so great. Um, but also we actually updated it again today. So there's even more information. So here you can see the number of cases like Dr. Stone was saying, unfortunately, how many deaths. You can see where there's outbreaks in the community, whether in long-term care, retirement homes, in the hospitals, if there are any. And right now we have another piece about the community piece. So it tries to tell you um, where cases are occurring in the community and if it's based on community spread due to travel, due to contacts from someone who's been sick. So I really recommend if you haven't been there already, you check out the site. We also have great social media presence, uh, constantly putting out information. Uh, a few minutes ago, I got an update that our data tracker has had a lot of hits. Um, so there's just a lot of great information. I really do recommend that people who live in Durham region, and even if you don't live in Durham region, uh, check out that main site. Next one there, Cindy. So the municipal sites, I also find a tremendous resource. So I don't live in Ajax or Pickering, um, but in my own municipality, um, I do um, have our own, I live in Aurora, Ontario. Um, so I have our main site bookmarked because municipalities do things differently for how they open parks, what's available, what resources locally. So as you've heard today, um, there's more opening up. So some parks are opening up and you can walk through them now or you can fly a kite, but you can't sit down on the benches in most places. But to find out specifically what your town or municipality is doing, you need to go to their main site. So for example, the town of Ajax has a great site. They have a COVID specific information hub, which I find to be excellent. Usually municipalities will link back to the, um, the region that you're in. So for us, it would be back to the health department website. And like I said, it's great to know what's happening locally. So they have a fantastic social media presence on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well. And now I follow them. Um, and the city of Pickering, the same. So if you live in Pickering, check out their main site, pickering.ca forward slash COVID-19. And again, uh, Pickering has specific information for um, residents who are unsheltered or underhoused. They have a great site too on cancellation of city events. And again, great social media presence. So this one is really important. And I find that many of the questions when I'm doing other town halls or answering questions, a lot of the questions actually come based on information people are hearing that perhaps um, would not be from a recognized source, which, which it happens. There's so much like we saw in that second graphic, right? Information is bombarding us from everywhere. But fake news is very hard to differentiate sometimes. So it comes across as looking like fact, and that's it comes that way to you on purpose, so you believe it, right? You read it and you think, well, this looks like a trusted source. And it can range anywhere from a little bit of misinformation so Dr. Stone talked earlier about airborne um, disease and how we don't think that COVID-19, we know that right now COVID-19 is not airborne, but you may get um, a, a news article forwarded to you or a social media post forwarded to you that says that we know that COVID-19 is now airborne. And you would say, hmm, I had Dr. Tony Stone, who seems pretty reputable, tell me that it's not. So you would sort of think maybe this isn't a great news source, but it would look factual when it came to you. So next one there, Cindy. So how to spot it. So the big things for me are, I, I get many things forwarded to me, so I always check the sources too. So for me, it's the big one. Is it from World Health Organization? Is it from the Public Health Agency of Canada? Is it from the Ontario government or Public Health Ontario? And is it from my local public health department or is it from my municipal government? If it is none of those things and it's not sort of a journal article from a trusted journal, uh, I'll probably take a pass on reading it. Anything that tells you that it's too good to be true, right? So drink this, uh, what have one I've seen? If you drink hot water in the morning, it will cure your COVID-19. Those are very outlandish, obviously too good to be true. Hot warm water, obviously, if, if that was the cure, we wouldn't have any problems right now across the world, which we do um, with COVID-19. So anything that is outlandish, um, I would ask you to just take a second look. And like I said here, just make sure that um, supporting evidence is from a reliable source. And the big thing, if it looks too good to be true, please don't share it to others because the more this spreads, um, the more people like Dr. Stone and myself have to sort of try to counteract. 
uh, the information. So the next slide is just stay home, stay safe. Um, Dr. Stone mentioned it and I want to reiterate it. We are, we're close, we're not there yet. We don't know we're over the curve until we're sort of over the curve and looking back over our shoulder. And we certainly don't want the physical distancing, the social distancing, the great hand washing, the staying at home. Everyone has sacrificed so much. So for us to release that quickly, um, we'd be worried about a second wave happening again. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and we'll get there together, but certainly we need to keep up with our um, public health measures. So thank you. That's the end of my information. And I really look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A. And back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. McTavish, for your remarks. Just a reminder that questions continue to be accumulated throughout the presentations via chat and star nine for phone participants. For our third presentation, I welcome Alec King, Communication Lead, Canadian Mental Health Association, Durham. Mr. King has worked in community mental health for more than 15 years. From starting as a frontline support worker, he now serves as the CMHA Durham communication lead. He works towards breaking the stigma surrounding discussions of mental illness and informing the community of the supports available. He lives in Bowmanville with his wife and three young energetic children. Tonight, Mr. King will speak about strategies for good mental health. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Alec King and I'd like to thank you all for having me here and for coming to attend today's session. And I'm going to talk about managing stress and anxiety during COVID-19. Uh, Cindy, if you just go to the next slide, please. So just a, a brief rundown of what we're going to look about. We're going to talk about defining mental health, stress, what stress can be specifically during the current situation, um, coping with job loss, which is a major issue for people right now, coping with increased work demands, stress overload, and how we can fix uh, what we can do about that. Things like resilience, focus, and doing what's good for you. So, um, mental health defined. Mental health is the capacity of each and all of us to feel, think, and act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges we face. It is a positive sense of emotional and spiritual well-being that respects the importance of culture, equity, social justice, interconnections, and personal dignity. It's about having a balance in your life. Mental health and physical health are intertwined. Stress is the body's reaction to a change that requires physical, mental, or emotional adjustments or response. Stress can come from any situation or thought that makes you feel frustrated, angry, nervous, or anxious. And stress doesn't always look stressful. It can be a situation where there's uh, something new or beneficial that you might be looking forward to. Maybe it is a new job that you're excited about, but even though you don't feel immediately that kind of pressure, it mounts and it can be part of what becomes very stressful for you and causes anxiety. And it impacts all of our mental health. Um, so we're currently experiencing a number of different kinds of grief. Uh, we feel the world has changed, and it has. Even though we know that this is a temporary, we, we don't feel like it's right now since there's such an uncertainty about how this is going to end. We're experiencing grief in the form of our collective loss of normalcy, fear of the economic toll that it's going to take, and the loss of social connection. We feel like we've lost our sense of safety and security, especially since this is something that we can't really see. There's no visible thing in front of us to deal with. And our minds are being protective. Uh, we start thinking about the worst, and we are seeing the worst of this situation in a lot of cases. The rising counts in cases, unfortunately, in deaths, um, and repeatedly checking the news like uh, uh, Peppy and Dr. Uh, Stone were talking about, sorry, Dr. Peppy and Dr. Stone were talking about. Um, we think it's only going to get worse or so many people have been affected, it's only inevitable that we're going to get it too. Or maybe you think things like this will never end. So a coping with a job loss. So our jobs are much more than just the way we make a living. Uh, they influence how we see ourselves as well as the way others see us. They give us structure, purpose, and meaning. That's why job loss and unemployment can be so stressful and devastating to people. In addition to the health anxiety that the virus brings, job loss and unemployment involves a lot of change all at once and can be very stressful. So beyond the loss of income, losing a job also comes with other major losses, some of which may be even more difficult to face. Things like losing your sense of professional identity, your self-esteem and confidence that came with your position or the job that you worked at, your daily routine, a purposeful activity. And I think you can see a lot of people talking about 
boredom and making sourdough bread and stuff like that. Um, a work-based social network, your friends that you have at work, and your sense of security that comes with a job and income and everything like that. So it's normal to feel angry or depressed, grieve for all that you've lost, or feel anxious about what the future holds. But no matter how devastating your loss seems right now, there is hope. With, with time and the right coping techniques, you can come to terms with these setbacks, ease your stress and anxiety, and move on with your future career. Next, please. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. So uh, grief after job loss. Grief is a natural response to any loss, and that includes the loss of a job. So give yourself time to adjust and kind of accept that this is the new normal for a while. Try to accept your feelings and go easy on yourself. Uh, losing a job can force you to make rapid and significant changes in all those ways we talk about your social circles, your daily patterns and routines, and that can leave you feeling upset, angry and depressed and out of balance. Um, think of your job loss as a temporary setback. And in this case, it, it might be. Most successful people have experienced major setbacks in their careers, but have turned things around by picking themselves up, learning from their experience, and trying again. And you can do the same thing. Express your feelings in a creative way. So writing about your loss in a journal, for example, can help you to look realistically at your new situation and put things into perspective. Sorry, I just thought the question there. I was worried I was doing something wrong. Um, Everyone grieves differently, um, but you can still know what you cannot control and stick to things that you can actually handle and, uh, and make better. So stock up on compassion and not on toilet paper. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Um, so coping with increased work. Demands. On the other hand, if you haven't lost your job or if you're not dealing with a situation like that, you might be in a situation where you're dealing with massively increased work demands. And that can be anyone who's still currently working in essential service or even dealing with new and changing situations because their work has altered. Maybe it's a situation where you're doing deliveries for your job, but um, you feel like you're being put under pressure is very normal. And stress is not a reflection of what you can or can't do. It's not a judgment of your capacity to be able to handle something. It's just how you're coping with the new changes. Managing your mental health and well-being, especially during this time, is as important as managing your physical health. So take care of yourself and try to use coping strategies such as ensuring you get enough rest, eat healthy food and engage in physical activity, and stay in contact with family and friends as much as possible. Using strategies to manage stress that have worked for you in the past can benefit you now. You know your own self-care best, what works best for you, what makes you feel better in any kind of stressful situation. You can also turn to your colleagues, your managers, or others that you trust for social support. Chances are people are going through the same thing you are. They're feeling the same kind of change and stress. And what might feel like you are just complaining about an inevitable situation could lead to something where you are talking about ways to make a situation better and could lead to positive uh, changes. So rotate your tasks from high stress to lower stress functions if possible. If you work in a very high demand job, if you have situations where you can work on tasks that don't require the same amount of energy or commitment, then rotate between those. Don't, you know, try and plow through and get all the hard things done at once. Be, take, take it easy on yourself and try and break things up. Keep yourself protected from chronic stress and poor mental health during this time to have you, give you a better capacity to fulfill your role. Be sure you keep in mind that the situation will not go away overnight and focus on the present. So stress overload and some warning signs. So there's emotional overload and you, you'll see increase in worry about your health, hear about something in the news that provokes anxiety, and we feel that we have some symptoms. So that could be uh, increased worry about your health, uh, irritability or short temper, or feeling of isolation. And then there's also cognitive issues. So increased attention to physical processes. So you may feel odd pains or sensations, things that you feel unusual or uncomfortable that might just be ordinary bodily symptoms, but because of everything that you're concerned about, you might see it as an illness rather than just a, an everyday thing. So you may see memory problems, inability to concentrate, poor judgment or anxious or racing thoughts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there's also physical signs such as headaches, stomach pain, nausea, diarrhea, uh, rapid heart rate or sweating, increased tension or pain, loss of sex drive, decreased energy levels, and you may encounter behavioral issues as well. So that's isolation, um, eating less or more, uh, engaging in risky or dangerous behavior, reduced productivity if you're having trouble sleeping or perhaps you're sleeping too much, and you may engage in nervous habits that you have. Uh, 
So what is resilience? Resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, or workplace and financial stressors. Um, it means bouncing back from difficult experiences, situations where you may be going through stress and trauma and finding a way through it. So 10 ways to build resiliency. Sorry, next slide, please. So step one is to make connections. Good relationships with close family members, friends, or others are important. So you can accept help and support from those who care about you and will listen to you and help strengthen your resilience. Some people find that being active in civic groups, uh, whether they're faith-based faith -based organizations or other local groups, service groups and things like that can help with reclaiming hope. And they find that assisting others can really be very helpful to them. It brings them that kind of support. So avoid seeing crisis as an insurmountable problem. You can't change the fact that highly stressful events happen, but you can change how you interpret and respond to those events. Except that change is a part of living. Certain goals may no longer be attainable as a result of adverse situations. And I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with that now where things have changed so dramatically. So move towards your goals. Develop new and realistic goals based on what's going on right now, what you can work towards, and take decisive action. Act on adverse situations as much as you can. Uh, next slide, please. Look for opportunities for self-discovery. People often learn something about themselves and may find that they have grown in some respect as a result of struggle with loss. I think we're seeing a lot of people who are turning, you know, finding new skills and new things they can do in this kind of situation. I think, um, you know, you just have to look on Facebook and see all the new kind of things people are realizing they could do and skills are developing. And nurture a positive view of yourself. Look at those things that you can do and they'll help you develop confidence, your ability to solve problems and trust your instinct and helps you build resilience. And keep things in perspective. Even when facing very painful events, try to consider the stressful situations in a broader context and keep a long-term perspective. And maintain a hopeful out outlook. An optimistic outlook enables you to expect that good things will happen in your life. Many people who have experienced tragedies and hardships have reported better relationships, greater sense of strength, even while feeling vulnerable, with an increased sense of self-worth, a more developed spirituality and heightened appreciation of life through these kind of stressful situations. And, and number 10 is take care of yourself. Pay attention to your own needs and feelings. So focus on what you need and what's good for you. So focus on what's strong rather than what's wrong. Take this as a time to kind of take an inventory of what you have and what you can do and focus on what you can do to shore those things up and make yourself feel better about that and be stronger. It's more back to taking control of what you can and trying to separate yourself from the things you can't control. So we're always trying to fix what's wrong. What you need to do is focus on what's right in your life and work towards that. And knowing the difference between what you can change and what you do not have an effect of on at all. We need to look at the locus of control, the areas we can actually handle and work with. So we can't change other people's responses to events, but we can change our own. And I think that ties back to a lot of what the, the doctors were talking about in terms of uh, where you're finding your appropriate information. People may tell you things and you may hear rumors, but make sure that you're kind of keeping that in track of what you know to be true and accurate. So do what feels good for you. Keep things in perspective. Challenge intrusive thoughts, but don't ignore them. Consider the level of attention and seriousness being paid to COVID-19. It's normal to feel really anxious about it. Um, notice and challenge your thoughts that may be extreme or unhelpful. So make a goal for yourself. Rather than ignore those thoughts or try to make them go away, try to find a balance in the things you're thinking. If you feel yourself, feel yourself starting to have images of the worst, reframe your negative thoughts into positive thoughts. Um, rather than thinking the spread is inevitable, reframe it into we're working on this, There's everyone is together as a community working to make this better. And with that kind of strength, we'll definitely succeed. Um, so practice self-care and that's important for whatever it is for you. So self-care is critically important at this time as any worry can be made worse. If we aren't taking care of ourselves, then you need to lean on social supports, try to get enough sleep, eat healthy, exercise, and engage in enjoyable activities. Do things that you like. Um, do things you would typically do to support your health, things you would normally do in any given situation uh, and every day. And be sure to use caution and follow health and safety guidelines while doing them. So basically make sure that you are um, maintaining social distancing as best you can. Um, bring yourself back to the present. So instead of thinking about, think, think what will happen or could happen in the world, think about where you are and what you're doing right now. Sounding an internal monologue in your head of exactly what you're doing can help calm anxious thoughts. Again, rather than thinking about the negative change that into 
right now I'm thinking at my kitchen, I'm sitting at my kitchen table, listening to a webinar about mental health and coping through this. Or right now I'm reading a book in my comfortable bed, listening to my favorite song. And you'd be surprised how much it can put things in perspective for you and make you feel better about your current situation. So limit your news consumption, seek reliable information only. And I feel like that's been gone into in great detail by people much more qualified than me. So, uh, and take the recommended precautions by Health Canada and the Durham Region Health Unit and set reasonable goals for yourself every day. Um, make a to-done list instead of a to-do list. And I see that my time's winding up, but just very quickly, a to-done list is the idea that at the end of the day, you would go through and you would look at what you have accomplished. Look at what you've done that's positive and what makes you feel that you've done a good job. And from there, you can um, just recognize what you've done. Um, and help is still available. Help is still out there for you to reach. Um, there's the Bounce Back program. The Ontario government recently, recently announced that they're putting more funding into virtual services. So reach out to your local health organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. King, for your remarks. Just a reminder that questions continue to be accumulated via chat and phone. Staff will follow up with customers for any questions that remain unanswered. I now turn the Q&A portion of this event over to our co-host, Jessica Trenier. Okay, so we can just um, invite all of the panelists back. So if you want to turn your webcams back on, you can join us up top here. Um, Perfect. So we have been collecting questions throughout the presentation. A lot of amazing questions coming in from the audience. So thank you so much for participating in that. Um, so there are a couple questions that are directed to specific speakers. Otherwise, I will just ask everyone a question. Or if you need to jump in as well um, and lend your expertise, that would be perfect as well. So the first question is going to Dr. Stone. Um, so is the backlog of deferred surgery substantial or is it manageable over months to get back to its previous rate? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's, it's a great concern uh, that we are really accumulating this backlog. Uh, when, when the pandemic first started hitting us here in Durham uh, and the government basically asked for all essential sur surgeries to end, uh, we, our, our surgical volume re um, went down to 18% of normal. And so basically it was life or limb, which is what was going on across the province. Then a couple of weeks ago, we ramped up to 38% of our normal volume of surgery. Uh, and a lot of that is, are things like cancer surgeries that, uh, that can't wait uh, and other non-cancer uh, urgent surgeries where if you wait, you're going to um, create uh, long-term health problems. We are now in the process with government of, of trying to understand how best to ramp up further. Uh, there is a, a very big backlog, a backlog that's accumulating. Uh, I heard an estimate yesterday that uh, the, the current backlog could take 11 months uh, to clear. Uh, we already had big wait lists uh, and we are accumulating more weight. Um, so uh, all I can say folks is we're all in this together and we're gonna, there's gonna be a, a restructuring in the way healthcare is delivered. You know that uh, as, as if we can keep this, the condition uh, in control in the community, it increases our ability to redirect resources to non-COVID activity like surgery. So, um, so uh, it will be a long, uh, slow process, but we're working hard uh, to solve it. Um, but it is going to take uh, many, many months to really um, uh, clear the backlog. Great. Thank you. Um, and this is to anyone. Um, can someone be more infectious while being asymptomatic? Peppy, do you want to jump in? Dr. Right, the question was, can they be more infectious? Yes. Or can they just be infectious? <laughs> Both, if you would like to go down okay. that. <laughs> well, I'll refer to my clinical colleague uh, to certainly jump in. Um, but his point was very well taken. We think that people are obviously more infectious when they're sicker. So, for example, if somebody has, they're so sick that they're in hospital for weeks and weeks, that individual is likely more infectious than somebody who's out in the community and has perhaps a tickle in their throat or <clears throat> a bit of a scratchy cough. When you're sick and you're coughing constantly, you're then spreading your droplets, um, you're, you're more contagious in general. 
the period before people show symptoms or that asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic period is still um, under uh, heavy review, like Dr. Stone had mentioned. Right now, now we have a very good sense that it's the two days before somebody becomes asymptomatic or some symptomatic. So there's that period of asymptomatic where you're not showing, or is it pre-symptomatic where we're conditioned in our lives to just not notice that we're not feeling the best or not notice that we have um, a sore throat or a headache. So it's really tough. Um, we know that there is some asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic or very low symptomatic that we're ignoring spread out there. And I think in six months, a year, when we look back on the research, we'll have a much better handle on what it actually meant um, and, and how long before people got sick we should have looked. Um, so I think it's up for debate, but certainly if you're sicker, you're gonna spread it a lot more. Um, and I can refer over to my clinical colleague, Dr. Stone. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add to Dr. McTavish is you, when you think about how quickly we got hit with this, uh, this new, this novel uh, virus, we're just learning a lot. And I would tell you that it's, it's still unclear about how long we, we remain infectious. So there's, there's research going on and it's not straightforward about when do you finally, are you no longer infectious and when are you resolved? So we use, uh, uh, we use a couple of strategies here, uh, which is commonly used by public health around uh, uh, you know, 14 days, uh, people are considered resolved when they're, ace, you know, um, from uh, day 14 of onset, as long as they've been asymptomatic uh, uh, for at least 72 hours. There's a, there's a number of strategies that are used and different countries are using slightly different criteria. So it is problematic. Um, I think what, what, we, what I would say is for folks uh, who are symptomatic, uh, we, we are right. We are certainly using, you know, uh, uh, public health's approach, which is that um, we need to self-isolate for a full 14 days and we need to, we need to be symptom free. And Pepe, please correct me for anything uh, that's incorrect here, but it's, it's for at least 72 hours. Um, and so, so uh, that's, I think that's the best advice we could give you right now, because it is a moving target and we, you will hear as the months roll by and research advances, maybe uh, more information about this. Great, thank you. Um, so looking at that kind of de-containment area or going to like the stage three of reopening, um, could you describe what this is going to look like? Um, how close will people be able to um, stand together? There's a few questions that kind of connect to each other with this, um, a couple of questions about the social distancing, are we still going to require the six feet of social distancing once we get to different stages um, of letting people back into the, back to normal? Um, is it better for people to jog, walk, or run without a mask like later on, or what will that stage look like, do we think? I can talk in generalities and then Dr. Stone can talk about um, the stage three. Uh, it was in his okay. slide, but he's certainly better at it. So it's Perfect. a good question about getting outside and being active and what does that mean for social distancing? Um, it's a great point. So that's why a lot of parks and trails were closed because they were just, they were too narrow. People couldn't have that, that six feet or two meters of distance. So although things are opening up a little bit, um, hardware stores are open, you know, stores may be open for curbside next week and we're gonna see perhaps a gradual reopening all of that is with current public health measures of social distancing, still staying home if you don't need to be out. So if you don't need to be, I don't know, shopping for new rain boots, maybe you don't for the next, you know, few months, right? It still really needs to be you go out when you need to go out. And the social distancing is so important. And the mask piece is important because people wear them when they run. I see that. I don't. I run. I don't, I don't wear a mask. But if you can't keep your social distance, if you can't stay six feet or two meters apart, that's when we recommend that you do wear a non-medical or a non-surgical mask in the community. So that is to protect other people from your droplets. So you wear a mask to keep your droplets, your nose droplets, your mouth droplets in yourself. So if everybody goes outside and does that, it decreases the risk of spread. So certainly uh, we're going to see things opening up, but that physical distancing and the consistent washing of hands, the 20 seconds, rub, 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 top and bottom, do watch a video. You will be surprised that you are not doing it correctly. Um, but this, the public health measures will remain in effect, certainly. And Dr. Stone, I'll pass it over to you for the, um, I think the phase three opening with the question. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. McTavish. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, without um, uh, uh, repeating, you know, uh, what, what's, what we're all witnessing now, which is 
stage one, two, and three of phase two. Now, just I'll just clarify for folks. You know, they've 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 described three phases and three stages in phase two, and we're now going. We're now um, hopefully continuing to work through each of the stages of phase two, which is this re, which is this reopening, um, and uh, the you know the exact sequence and with the with the types of of businesses uh, that are reopening. Uh, I, I don't have a line of sight to that. That really is work that is being done at the provincial level. I'll say that um, uh, phase three, which is what they call the recovery phase, is something that I think will go on a long time. Uh, what we don't know, uh, you know, remember that um, uh, what we understand is by and large, we need what we call herd immunity uh, to have confidence uh, that, uh, that really the, the risks of now acquiring COVID have, have uh, subsided significantly before we, um, I would say, return to what everyone would call full normal. Um, we are in a different world, folks, with uh, this new virus. Uh, it's unprecedented for all of us, and so we're learning. I, I would just sort of reinforce what Dr. McTavish says, which is even as we reopen more and more, um, until you know there's mass vaccination or a clear understanding that we've achieved herd immunity, uh, over time, uh, I think uh, it will be critical for all of us to, to retain that situational awareness, do all the right things with, with the basics, um, and, uh, and that includes uh, the, the hand hygiene and the distancing. Now, you'll know that right now what, what we're told is, um, you know, in your own household, uh, then there's no expectation of distancing. But I think what will happen is, as we start to open up more, it may well be that we will do prudent things and this is not research-based because there's just not enough information yet, but prudent things would be, as we start to have friends over, we make sure that we're really attentive to, uh, you know, having um, wiped off surfaces, hand hygiene, social distancing with even our friends, but uh, in our own shared space. I think we're gonna be all needing to do a lot of common sense things to um, keep ourselves and our, our friends and family and neighbors safe. And that's for a long time to come. Uh, again, this is my advice, it's not specific uh, information that's being shared by, uh, you know, PHAC or PHO, but I think we, this is a different world. And so the more careful we are, uh, the better. Perfect. Uh, I forgot to unmute myself for a second there. Um, and on the discussion of masks, I think that that's something that's coming up a lot, um, is, whether or not you can be refused service, um, so doctor's offices, and there's a, a recent question about businesses, can you refuse service to individuals who are not wearing masks? And you all work in very different environments, so I think this would be a good question to hear from everyone. That's, I can answer that. So I'm certainly not a business owner, um, so I can't understand or I can't imagine what the um, like the stresses must be right now thinking about like reopening and what does that mean for social distancing and uh, I know the government is putting out um, sort of guidebooks or guidelines for the type of um, in the Ministry of Labour too about what's expected of you as an employer, um, as a business owner for what's going to happen. For example, you're in the grocery store, you see the lines on the ground for social distancing, right? So That'll sort of be in play everywhere, um, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure that the government will mandate masks. Um, this isn't really a mandating government. Uh, we like to, um, you know, encourage through education um, adherence to certain principles and things. So I don't know. That's a really good question. We we sort of we keep sort of hearing rumors that there'll be sort of more mandatory masking or like a very a very strong suggestion for universal masking everywhere but right now it's masking if you can't social distance so i'm not sure if we see lessening we'll see stronger messaging around that it's a great question um i would say look to the ministry of labor uh, for their guidelines coming out for your type of service for example personal service settings i think i saw a comment there about hairdressing services so i know that if i was out in the community and i could not maintain that social distance for example if i was getting my hair done when it's time to open up again um, i would certainly be wearing a mask because I would not be doing the social distancing and I would hope that um, who I was going to visit would be as well. But for mandating, uh, I don't see that on the horizon, but I am not a lawmaker on Ontario. Thank you. And anything to add to that, Alec or Dr. Stone? Uh, no, I, um, just uh, we, we've seen a couple of countries start to uh, put this in place. I think uh, Italy and Austria have. 
uh, and then I, at least one city in the United States. Uh, I, again, I, I, I agree with Dr. McTavish. Um, uh, for us, uh, the important thing would be to be thoughtful and prudent about mask use. Uh, and certainly if the government changes direction, uh, we'll all know about it if it's being enforced in some way. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think that we've been having some connectivity issues. So um, I'm going to ask Alec a question because you're here now again. Um, so has CMHA seen a rise in requests for services? Have you um, seen that kind of across the board with mental health services? Uh, yeah, um, and uh, it's very tricky just because we have moved to the situation now where we can't have people meeting face to face and it's, it's changed a lot of what we do. We are doing more virtual meetings and we are doing more connection that way and we've actually increased a lot of the services that we're providing. Um, we are trying to provide more services out to the community as a whole. Um, we're always open to everyone, but we also have our recovery college, which is offering courses and things like mindfulness dealing with stress, developing a wellness plan, and those are available online completely free for anyone to sign up for. Uh, the response has been very good, but the great thing about them is it's an unlimited resource, so everyone can sign up for it and use it as they'd like. Um, I'd also point people towards the uh, CMHA Ontario's Bounce Back program, which is a, a fantastic source of assistance for people dealing with a mild to moderate anxiety, depression. Um, it can provide assistance through workbooks or it can provide one-on-one -on -one, um, discussions and time conversation. So, uh, but yes, we have seen an expansion in our services and, and more requests, not just from our, our everyday consumers, but also from everyone else in the community as well. Great, thank you. Um, and does anyone know of any organizations that are accepting donations of cloth masks? I think that can kind of go to everyone. Else. Yes, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> uh, we, we are because um, our, we have a, a primary care clinic that's still open. We have uh, people coming in and we're requiring people when they come in to wear a cloth mask just for the protection of all of our clients and all of our service providers. Um, we've been very, very lucky in receiving donations from the community and we continue to accept those for anyone who is able to and willing to help. Um, you can go to our website, uh, cmhadurham.ca or connect with us through any form of social media and we'll be able to uh, work out all the uh, details with that but yes we would happily accept any donations of cloth masks perfect and um, we'll include that on the um when we send out the follow-up email as well the resources um that you had listed uh the bounce back program and everything like that too thank you um so i, th I think we might be on like one last question about masks. I think we're getting through this. I think there's just so much information about masks being put out there and so there can be a lot of misinformation, but um, there are there is a question about medical workers and first responders wearing the N95 masks um, for personal protection, but uh, wearing a mask in a store won't protect the wearers. So is that a difference between the cloth mask versus a medical mask or a surgical mask versus the N95 mask? Um, do you know? Well, let me let me weigh in a wee bit here. Um, you know, there's, a, there's there's still a lot of ongoing research into what what are all the strategies that are needed uh, for safety. Uh, the, the key ones that we know of uh, are really around hand hygiene and, and the distancing. Um, the issue of masks, I think, is, is going to be ongoing. Specifically for, our list, you know, for the folks who are listening, I would comment that in this current global shortage of personal protective equipment and masks, it is important. Uh, when we, we already talked about the issue of, of uh, surgery in the backlog. When we have um, masks being, and there's very good evidence, folks, about droplet and, and what type of mask to wear and where they're needed. So things like N95s, we really need them for the highest risk procedures that are done in the hospital. Uh, uh, I can't stress that enough. It's so important. Uh, that's, where, that's where they belong. Um, and uh, and, and it, we are all very safe not wearing that type of mask uh, out, out in the community. Now, there's lots of folks, you know, um, even surgical masks uh, right now, we're concerned about their availability. We for sure need surgical masks uh, for care in the hospital and in other healthcare settings. Um, you know, you think about uh, uh, long-term care, retirement home, and, and uh, all kinds of 
um, community uh, clinical activity like primary care. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, right now, all I can say is, is the evidence says that the cloth masks help to contain droplets. Uh, we don't have evidence yet uh, that they improve, in, that they actually make us safe the way other masks do. Um, but that's why we are, um, we are certainly wanting folks to do the distancing and so on. So it isn't, it isn't perfect. I would say to you that if we had an, a millions and millions of surgical masks, uh, you might hear us saying, everyone please wear surgical masks. Uh, uh, but but uh, if, if, we, if that happens, we won't have enough to provide appropriate care in clinical settings. Thank you. Um, so a question um, about um, COVID and for people who have had COVID-19, could they have permanent damage to their lungs or could they be prone to other types of illnesses that affects the lungs? Well, I'll start and Dr. McTavish, uh, please, please jump in. Um, and the answer, the, the answer is that most make a full recovery. Um, there, there are some who can have some structural changes from uh, the people who, are, who have very severe illness. Uh, but by and large, um, most make a full recovery. And sorry, there were two parts to your question. One was about... Uh, um, if it would have, like, be permanent damage to their lungs or whether they would be prone to other illnesses that affect the lungs. Uh, well, certainly during the illness, we worry about uh, things like what we call bacterial superinfection. But by, but by and large, when folks make a full recovery, it is a full recovery, and they return to their usual health. Uh, so, you know... Um, uh, that's 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 typical, uh, but it is possible within in the cases of severe illness that there's some residual damage to the lungs, uh, as with other types of diseases that can happen as well. Dr. McTavish, did you have anything to add to that? No, the only thing I'll add is it's tangentially related because it comes up a lot. We've had a question. There was a town hall last night, and there was a question about can people be reinfected with COVID, or how long you have immunity. Uh, and it's an important question because we don't know yet. So some research says that we have immunity for a few weeks if we get sick. Some research shows we can be reinfected right away. And from a public health lens, if somebody is recovered, we would actually sort of consider them as being completely um, able to get the disease again. So if someone was in a long-term care home, that's how we would actually group people, people who were negative or never infected. Um, with people who'd recovered, they would group together. So they'd both be at risk for getting infected. So that research again, maybe in six months, we'll look back and say that was, you know, that was clear. Um, but it's really, it's early days for a lot of this. So we really do need to wait and see where the research takes us. So for right now, uh, we do get a lot of questions about reinfection and immunity and it, and it is, it's early days. We just don't know yet. Thank you. Um, and a question for um, everyone, are seniors with weak immune systems, um, do you think that they'll be compromised as a result of so social distancing for so long. So do you think that that's something that we can see as we start to reintegrate is that individuals um, who are more vulnerable might be more susceptible to other things because their immune systems are a little weaker? Well, I think I get that at that. Um, so it's, it's actually a really good question because now as we're getting into more springtime, uh, what we usually see in the sort of the more winter illnesses like influenza, uh, that sort of has peaked. Right? So things that I'd be more concerned about um, with people with decreased immune systems going out in the winter, I'd be less concerned about now. That's a good question. Um, I think um, I will defer to my clinical colleague, Stone, but I think in general, like we've been recommending that people who are immune compromised stay home, that they self-isolate. Um, if they do go out, they make sure that it's essential visits only, meticulous hand hygiene, that they, that they were wearing a mask originally. They were one of the groups that it was recommended they wear a mask. So I think as um, society sort of opens up again a little bit, if I had an immune compromising condition, I would speak to my primary care provider. I would ask about how my immune compromised system actually affects me because it's such a spectrum um, and talk to them about what my health, health risk would be going out. Um, and with that, I'll defer to Dr. Stone. Um, so what I'll say is, uh, and I think part of the question uh, was about whether uh, that the, so, the social distancing and the uh, home isolation uh, will in some way cause uh, folks to have a greater risk. Uh, I think that was, the, that was part of the question. The answer is no, that, that we wouldn't expect them to have a greater risk. 
uh, we would we would expect them to to maintain the same level of risk. You know, if your if your health uh, and your immune system were strong before, uh, it will be strong after. If you were already at risk uh, and with with some level of compromise, that will continue. Um, but the but the the act of the of the distancing and the isolation wouldn't by itself uh, change your risk profile or your risk level. Great, thank you. Um, and another medical question coming in: If uh, Mars and SARS were more serious outbreaks, why has COVID respond or resulted, sorry, in many more deaths and widespread disease? Well, I'll start uh, because I, pr I probably need to clarify what I said um, in that uh, the, the mortality rate for uh, SARS and MERS, if you had it, was higher than it is with COVID-19. But that said, the, the um, uh, infectiousness of COVID-19 is much, is much higher than the other two. There are lots of reasons for that. Uh, and so the overall impact uh, globally has been has been so much uh, higher with COVID-19. We already know we're starting to approach uh, 4 million confirmed cases, probably many more than that that we haven't tested. Um, uh, but if but it really I was referring to uh, if you if you got the illness, what's the risk of severity or mortality? Um, just for clarity. And, and, and for, for, you know, we're, we're almost 4 million confirmed with COVID-19. I think there were around 8,800 8, total confirmed with SARS and far fewer even with MERS. Thank you. Um, with CMHA, have you seen a lot of requests for help with children from families? Um, is this a growing area of concern for mental health when parents are, are balancing a lot right now, I think? It is, absolutely. Um, we offer services for people ages 15 and up, but if anyone calls looking for support, we do direct people to the right programs and agencies that can help them with young children. In terms of, of caregivers and family members who may be dealing with stressful situations like these, we do help um, adults uh, with any kind of like stresses or issues they may be dealing with, and we have programs set up for that. We do find that it's, it's a growing section of the population where people are dealing with more kind of stress and anxiety issues, and also the children's mental health is something that we, we certainly need to be paying more attention to as a community. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question, um, on the data tracker, Pickering has an extremely high rate of COVID clients versus the rest of Durham. Is there some rationale for this uh, long-term care homes, community spread, uh, et cetera? So the person who asked the question uh, hit the nail on the head with the first thing. Uh, right now, um, as we see sort of a flattening of the curve in Durham, you'll notice that there is not a flattening of the curve in our long-term care and retirement homes. This continues to increase. Um, unfortunately, so that right now is what's driving um, the higher numbers in Pickering um, within Durham Region. Yes. Thanks. But thank you for checking out the data tracker. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, someone had heard that the virus has mutated and appears to be more contagious now, says researchers from Los Alamos National Lab. Is this true? So I would ask that they check the site where they got the information. I would ask that, um, you know, is it a reputable source? Is it from, I mean, it doesn't have to be from Canada, like there's CDC, there's, you know, great sources in the States and elsewhere. Um, but no, my understanding is uh, it has not mutated. That's not the type of virus this is. Coronaviruses do not mutate. Um, yes, that's the answer. They don't mutate, so no. <laughs> Um, there was a question that was um, asked. I'm going to change it a little bit just because the original question was, was when someone is asked to come into the Lake Ridge Health Assessment Center, what does that look like? Um, so I was wondering what that would look like as well if you were going to call um, Durham Region Health or call CMHA. What are the steps that an individual would go through? I think that might help relieve some anxiety about the unknown. Well, I can speak to the, uh, the COVID assessment center. Um, and uh, ba basically what happens um, from a process point of view is 
uh, whether it's through your uh, uh, through conversation with uh, 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 telehealth, um, through public health, or through your primary care doc, um, or directly through the website uh, at Lakeridge, you fill out a questionnaire uh, there, and um, and you you get screened. And if you meet certain screening criteria, uh, so let's say you're symptomatic and you meet certain criteria. So, uh, folks who, who um, are, are low risk and mildly ill will still be uh, asked to self-isolate uh, at home. But folks who, uh, where we have other uh, concerns, higher risk uh, healthcare workers, uh, there are a number of folks who meet that criteria. Uh, we, uh, or fo uh, folks who are very symptomatic, we want to bring them in. Uh, and depending on the uh, symptom severity, we start with the assessment center. And you'll be given directions when you make that contact about how to get to the assessment center. There are two. Uh, and you know that can change in the future as we think about how to how to serve uh, broadly the region. But uh, the one that's uh, closest to our listeners um, uh, is uh, at Ajax Hospital. So there's one at Oshawa Hospital, one at Ajax Hospital. Uh, and then what would happen is um, uh, we've repurposed uh, an ambulance, a part of the hospital that delivered ambulatory services into the assessment center. Uh, but all the directions will be given to you once once you make contact and you're and uh, then you're assessed and asked to come in. Uh, the directions will be clear, but it will be at the Ajax Pickering Hospital. Perfect. So, sorry. So for CMHA, um, currently we're um, directing people to call ahead of time before they come in, unless they have a pre-scheduled appointment. The majority of the services have gone uh, virtual, either through telephone or online. But people who are coming in for primary care or looking for primary care support can call, um, and they'll be screened. And then when they come into the office, they're screened again when they enter. Um, and then they can go on for services after that. But we are asking people to call ahead. And um, I've heard that you guys are offering Zoom services as well. So is that something that people um, can connect with uh, mental health professionals through Zoom or other video conferencing tools? Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And you'll find that, like, I mean, I, in a large area, so many different places have moved into this kind of online format, and it's fantastic to see. It's a level of access that a lot of people have been looking for in the past, because uh, usually the barrier in terms of reaching out and actually going to a place can be very high for people who are dealing with significant mental health issues. So this is a nice thing to see that hopefully will continue afterwards, where people can just lower one more bar to access to support. So uh, yes, and most organizations in most communities have moved to that as well. So if you are looking for your local mental health support, um, they're, almost all of them have moved to online supports. Awesome, great, thanks. And for the health department, so actually all of our clinical activities has been, have been shut down and all of our staff have been redirected to case and contact management of COVID-19 and the surveillance and the data piece that goes with it. So our sexual health clinics are closed. Originally we were doing very spaced out and you know, people were doing screening and then we were doing phone only visits and sort of phoning prescriptions in and trying to connect people to care. Um, but right now all of that's closed. Our breastfeeding clinics are closed. Our family visits are closed. So uh, it looks a lot different at the health department right now. But what that's going to look like when it opens back up again is a good question. Um, but so right now, if people have questions or concerns, they can come to the website. Certainly our website's excellent. Right at the top, it sort of lists what your options are. You can phone the Durham Health Connection line if you have questions and you want to speak to a nurse. The volume is still tremendously high. Leave a message, they will call you back, I promise. Um, and right there it tells you you can do the Ontario website self-assessment and if you're having symptoms you can be directed to the Lake Ridge Health online assessment and that's where most people end up going. Um, yeah, things look really different right now for us at the health department certainly. Um, so I would say a lot, of, a lot of the work is redirecting clients to the excellent site at Lake Ridge for the online assessment. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there is a question for Dr. Stone. Are there correlations between strokes in patients younger than 50 with COVID-19 or young children with other diseases like uh, Kawasaki disease? Uh, I can't say I've actually heard that. So I'll have to do my own homework uh, uh, to see if there's some evidence of that. Uh, I don't think that that's a typical complication uh, either. Um, in fact, uh, the good news for kids is that is that uh, COVID seems to be a much le uh, less severe uh, condition in the young the young population, uh, uh, those under under the age of twenty. Uh, so I'll have to um, we'll have to I'll have to dig to find out if there's such evidence, and then I'll uh, feed it back to you, Jessica, uh, and then we can give it uh, back to our listeners. Perfect. 
Sounds good. And um, a question to Dr. McTavish, in the future, would it be prudent that each city have a central health portal working with the Durham Public Health to share health information and support their respective communities as the Premier has suggested? A That word is not going to go well today. An overall approach where there is coordination of our resources, especially when age-friendly cities are being formulated. So that's an excellent question. So public health reorganization has occurred numerous times with uh, each version of the government that we get. Um, it's always a great question, you know, can we do things better, um, quicker, cheaper, faster, all the good things. Um, either way, regardless if the system gets a shakeup or not um, after COVID-19, public health is always local. It's always driven by central research and knowledge, central leadership, Public Health Ontario is here to stay. They will drive the research and they have the Public Health Ontario Lab as well, which is a just like a world renowned facility and resources. So even if you know health departments get a shake up or there's a different organization, it will still be local public health. It'll still be people, people delivering services in your community, public health nurses, you know, oral health clinics. Um, I can, I'm gonna get in trouble for not listing all the people who work in public health. Um, but it's such a community-based practice that even if it looks different a little bit at the top, the central uh, way you know public health in your community will not change. Great, thanks. And I do know that there are a couple more questions that have been popping up in chat that we will 100% make sure that we um, direct to our panelists and get back with some information. There will be a follow-up email going out that has the video link. Um, the resources that have been mentioned today, a couple of responses to questions that have not been addressed yet, as well as more information about questions um, that have been presented to the panel as well. Um, so I will now turn the floor back to Sarah um, to wrap it up for tonight. Yes. A big thank you to our presenters this evening, Dr. Tony Stone, Dr. Pepe McTavish, and Alec King. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us tonight and for providing valuable information that will help each of us cope with COVID-19 in our community. And thank you to our attendees for participating in this Ajax and Pickering Public Libraries Forum. Good night, everyone. <laughs>